more code of conduct in the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Shock! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jack wagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. Coming to you live from the top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike and I am online with you and I am live today. Good to be with you today. We are going to talk CRISPR today. The CRISPR DNA editing system, what it means, excuse me, what it does, how it does it, what does the Bible say about it, and you're going to see some things today that we're just going to go ahead and cue the music. Um... The topic of the program, and I I had this in my mind for several days now, no longer human, no longer human. I want you to remember that phrase because that is the destiny of all of mankind. He is destined to become no longer human. There's a story in the Bible. There is typology of this. There is a picture, not only a prophecy, but a prophetic foreshadowing of people being no longer human. And I got to make a note. I just got something in my mind here, and I got to make a note before I forget, because I've got so many things in my mind. Uh huh. Yep, 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 yep. That's what we're gonna do. Anyway, um, let me let me uh, run through some advertisements first, and let you know what is uh, going on. The Prophecy Roadshow will be in Pea Ridge, Arkansas, uh, April twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth. That is next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Pastor Jamie Doyle and his wife Chrissy. And his father uh, is the associate pastor, Ellis Doyle, and his wife, Donna. They are great friends of ours. They are wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, Brother Ellis got a chance to preach at the uh, Oak Lane ch- um, Church camp meeting uh, a couple week- weekends ago. And uh, it was just a joy to be with him and his family. And uh, we're looking forward. This will be uh, the second time. Uh, that I'll be going to Pea Ridge a few months ago. They had sort of their own mini camp meeting, and they had me just sort of kick everything off on a Friday night. Uh, We tried to stream it, and we just couldn't get a cell signal inside the building. So I've got a plan of trying to capture a good cellular signal outside of the building and bringing it inside of the building and uh, if that works, uh, then we will be streaming uh, the road show next Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. So if you are not able to attend, if you do not live in the Pea Ridge, uh, Pea Ridge is not too far from, uh, let's see here, Bentonville, Arkansas, Fayetteville, Arkansas. It's sort of on that side. The Woo, Pig Suey Razorback, right? Let me hear you. Yeah, there you go. There's our Hog fans. And uh, so anyway, we'll, it's not too far from that area, but we will be streaming if the Lord allows. Now, also, 
our Midwest Bible Conference. Let me show you. Let's see here. We have a, um, yeah, here we go. Let me put that over here and put that on the screen. Uh, our Midwest Bible Conference coming up uh, in uh, the first week of May, May 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, second annual Midwest Bible Conference. I mean, I love this. I love the fact that we're doing this. There are, there are some churches in this area that only use the King James Bible. I had uh, lunch with a couple of pastors yesterday, one of them my good friend and former school teacher, Brother Randy Casey, uh, invited me out to lunch, uh, him and another pastor, pastor, I think it was Pastor Greg, uh, but I'll well, believe the King James Bible, so there are some churches around here that still believe it. But to my knowledge, we're the only one that's actually promoting it by way of a special conference. Now, you're looking at the advertisement that is going to appear in the countywide newspaper. It's called The Leader. And it will be running. It's a, it's a once-a-week newspaper in this county. So it'll be running this Thursday, next Thursday, and the Thursday of the conference, May the 3rd. So we're going to run the ad for three weeks straight. And what we're, what we're trying to do this year is incorporate the idea of promoting the King James Version of the Bible along with the issue of the Second Amendment. I've spoken to uh, uh, Brother Chris Pinto, documentary filmmaker, good friend of mine. He and I were both speaking. Uh, I think this is now the third year in a row, second year maybe, that we have worked together um, at the uh, at the Red River Prophecy Conference up in Fargo, North Dakota. Actually, it's Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, but anyway, I heard him mention some things at this year's conference concerning the history of the Second Amendment. And I had not made up my mind yet who I was going to have to come and speak. When I talked to Chris after his presentation, uh, I told him, I said, man, I loved what you said. Do you have any information on the history of the Second Amendment? The Second Amendment, of course, is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, meaning Congress cannot take our guns away. And, uh, of course, he said yes, and so we're going to incorporate the two ideas of our sword and our sword, our right to carry a Bible and our right to carry a weapon. Those rights are not given to us by the Constitution of the United States. Those rights are given to us by God. And the Constitution of the United States forbids the government from infringing on those rights. The right of the people to assemble, to worship freely the God that they choose to worship, and how they choose to worship that God, and what to believe. In the United States of America, we are not government forced to believe or be part of a particular church. There is an official church in England. There is an official church in Germany, the Lutheran church. And from what I can remember, um, seems like I remember, I may be wrong on this, but I think the Lutheran church in Germany is supported by tax dollars. Isn't that interesting? But still and yet, most Germans, whether they would call themselves Lutherans or not, do not believe the Bible. They do not believe that it is the inerrant word of God and that what it says is right in every detail. And so anyway, in America, they cannot tell us that we cannot believe the Bible, and they cannot tell us that we cannot carry a weapon. And so we are going to 
just sort of include and those issues they're they're very important to me um i know what chris pinto believes about it and i also know that brother reg kelly who will be with us at least one night if i can talk him into two i will he's hard to get to to stay more than a night but anyway um if i can get him to come here at least two nights, I know where he stands on both of these issues. He is a staunch supporter of the King James Bible and a staunch supporter of our Second Amendment rights. And again, the Second Amendment does not give us the right to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment understands that the right given to us has already been given to us by God And it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And the implication of that is God has already given us the right to defend ourselves, our our property, to defend our wives and children if need be, and to defend our nation. As long as Americans have the right and are are maintain the right to keep and bear arms, we will never be successfully invaded by any foreign power in this country. It'll never happen. No no nation would want to come up against two, three hundred million people that are armed to the teeth and are not going to give up their rights to carry those weapons and our bumper stickers say you can have my gun when you pry it from my cold dead fingers. I have I made this statement before in a family, dear family of ours, uh, watchers online, they made me a plaque that says you can have my King James Bible when you pry it from my cold dead fingers. And I, I love that. Got that hanging up in my office. So anyway, uh, the uh, second annual Midwest Bible Conference coming up May 2nd, 3rd. Uh, and fourth, and of course, we will be streaming those services. Also, uh, something else I want to promote. Let me put that up on screen here, too, instead of you looking at a blank page. Um, uh, a wonderful family. Uh, they came and visited us here. Um, he's actually helped us uh, just sort of do a reboot of our website. Brother Rick Whitehead. Uh, He is, and he did not ask me to do this. I don't mind doing this for people that I know. He is running for sheriff in, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Kootenay, Kootenay County, sheriff, Uh, Kootenay. Somebody help me out with that. With that uh, pronunciation, K-O-O-T-E-N-A-I County, um, he is a independent, constitution-believing, conservative, God-fearing, Bible-believing, Second Amendment defender, NRA member, oath keeper. His priorities, building trust in the leadership of your sheriff's office, fiscal responsibility, raising the morale within the office, employee retention. Um, I love it. When we have sheriffs that not only respect the Constitution, but fear God and respect the Bible. And uh, there is a place here. He's not, again, he's not asked me to do this. There's a place in here to donate. Now you say, well, he's not running for sheriff in my county, so why does it matter? It matters because the more people that we can get in office— On the side of the right, the more we have, the better off we are as a nation. And so, Rick, if nothing else, God's people are going to be praying for you. And if you want to support him, you go to the website. It's uh, Rick, uh, let's see, rick4cid.us. And um, that's his website there. Go there and uh, at least drop him a line. Let him know that you're going to be praying for him. And that you hope that he wins, and um, we'll let you know how the election turns out when we get the results. All right, now, and one more thing I want to cover, then we're going to get into CRISPR, the CRISPR DNA editing system, and um, what implication it has as far as Bible prophecy, as far as 
even if you don't believe anything from the Bible, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. And with this technology, CRISPR DNA editing, it literally is going to change this entire world. And humans will be an extinct species. No longer human is where we're headed. Now, one more thing, and we'll, then we'll start on that. Uh, we've prayed about it, and uh, we are seeking the Lord in this. Uh, of course, we are having our homecoming um, August the, let's see, I'm going to put my calendar up here. August the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, that is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Southern Rays will be here with us once again. And, uh, of course, I'm still auditioning to be their piano player. So far, they they said they're still thinking about it. Uh, But anyway, the Bethel Homecoming. We invite people from all over the world to come and be with us on that weekend. It's specifically for those who love our church, consider themselves a part of this church, or you love our ministry, or you just like me, and you just want to come say, Pastor Mike, we like you. Now we're going to go back home. But anyway, August 3rd, 4th, and 5th, coming up Friday night, all day Saturday, teaching all day Saturday. And then, of course, Sunday, the uh, concert with Southern Raised and preaching God's word and the food. Oh, my goodness. The food is absolutely amazing. My sister and her husband do a pulled pork that is out of this world. They do a tremendous job. So anyway, August 3rd, 4th, and 5th, that's coming up. And then just a few weeks after that, uh, Sweetie Pie and I have been praying about it. Uh, our son-in-law, Michael, and our daughter, Alicia, we've been praying about it. Uh, Brother Mike Hudson is also going. We are planning another trip to Kenya. That will be August 23rd through August the 31st, which means I'll be gone one Sunday. And that what, see, what would that be? August the 26th. And uh, we'll have a good godly man behind the pulpit here at Bethel. But... Uh, Michael and I were just talking about it earlier, and here's what we have planned. Uh, One of the things we're going to do is we're going to assist Pastor Hutzel, uh, who has, um, he has been operating a sort of a Bible institute using the ACE, Accelerated Christian Education, uh, Bible teaching paces to, uh, to train and teach uh, a lot of the pastors out there, they just have no good, decent King James Bible training out there. It's just not, it's not easy to come by out there. And so uh, Brother Hutzel has, has worked with several of the pastors out there. They've completed the paces, and he's going to have sort of a graduation ceremony out there. And the plan is we're going to be doing some preaching there in Nairobi. Uh, my son-in-law Michael and I began to talk about it, began to pray about it. This is where my heart is. I, I'd love to help Mike Hutzel out, and I've done that in the past. However, God has shown me that the specific area of me ministering in Kenya is in the two places where our radio station is. Our first radio station that we put in is in Samburu, Samburu County. County is like a state in the United States. They have their own governor. And um, that was the first station we put out there. And if you remember a couple years ago, God enabled us to build and, and dig a water well for a school out there, but also publicly accessible for people who can walk there to go and get clean water. Clean water is something that they desperately need in those areas. They just don't have it. So God allowed us to uh, dig a well, build a tower, and put the tank on the tower and make and solar panels, uh, charge batteries that operate the pump. It's completely self-contained. I love it. And um, when I went out there and did the well dedication, God, I mean, it was, it was the best the best ministry trip I think I've ever taken in my life 
was in Samburu, Kenya. And God just laid it on my heart. Mike, this is what I've given you. This is the area. This is, these are the people that I've, that I've given to you. Not too long after that, we opened up a radio station in uh, Turkana. The capital city there is Lodwar. And we have our radio station office right there in Lodwar, Turkana. Uh, Turkana is a very long, narrow county. It is a very, very hot desert place. And again, they have a severe lack of clean water. The Catholic Church has built several strongholds in that area, and they do not like Bible Truth Radio operating in Lodwar, Turkana, Kenya. They've made that known. They tried to get me kicked off of my own radio station out there, and they've done it several times. And they, they give us grief. They harass us every chance they get. So what we would like to do is we would like to, number one, travel to Samburu for uh, a Sunday morning, preach out there, uh, visit and spend some time uh, at the radio station on air, travel back the same day. Then, a couple days after that, we would like to fly out to Lodwar, Turkana, Kenya. Uh, And I would be doing a... Pastor Mike Online live broadcast from Lodwar, Turkana, Kenya. We would be doing it at 12 noon uh, Kenya time, which would be about midnight here. So if you wanted to stay up and watch it live, you would be able to. But we'll also, of course, re-record it. We'll have it on Facebook. We'll have it on Sermon Audio. We'll have it on YouTube and so on and so on. Uh, The ladies of the church thought of the idea of putting together gift baskets for families out there that would contain uh, some very simple first aid uh, things, Uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol, things like that, Um, personal hygiene items, toothpaste, soap, um, deodorant, trust me, okay? Uh, They since most people can't afford deodorant, most people don't use deodorant in Kenya. And uh, to them, it's no big deal. But if you go over there, you know that they're not using deodorant. But the ladies of our church would like to put together little baskets like that and take them out there and give them to the families in Samburu, families in uh, Lodwar, Turkana. And uh, so a couple things we want to ask you to do. I, I just, you know me, I don't do this. But for, first of all, will you pray? Will you pray that God would uh, allow us to do this? If you remember, back in 2014, I attempted to go to Kenya. And God shut it down at the airport. It was, And for whatever reason, God was saying, I'm not to go to Kenya then. For whatever reason it was. We ended up losing money from the plane tickets. We got some of it back, but we ended up losing money over that. But God said, no, Mike, you're not going. And uh, But he did allow me to go to Samburu and visit out there. And it was one of the, the greatest, like I say, one of the greatest ministry times I think I've ever experienced in my life. So we would like to do that again in Samburu, in Lodwar. So we're asking for your prayers. And we're also asking, and you, you guys know I never do this, but the flight... To from Nairobi to Samburu. We have to take a helicopter. Uh, we can take an airplane to Lodwar. We would take the plane out there. We would visit the station, do some things in the community, do a Pastor Mike online, and then we would be flying back to Nairobi simply because it's not very safe uh, to spend the night in Samburu or spend the night in Lodwar. And that's sort of why we're we're planning it that way. And so if you would like to help underwrite this trip, uh, it would be me, Sweetie Pie, Michael, and his wife, Alicia. The ladies, of course, would be involved in distributing the the baskets for the families. Michael and I would be involved in traveling to the places and doing the things at the radio station. And so if you... um, if you, if you pray about it, if the Lord lays it on your heart to help us out with that, uh, we would appreciate it. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying now, if you don't give us such and such money, we're not going. 
that's not up to the money. That's up to the Lord. If the Lord says, this is what I want you to do, then we're going to go. And if God blesses it, God also finds a way to pay for it. But at least we would like to open it up for you, let you know the need, let you know what it is that we have planned, and then we'll just take it from there. All right. Now, enough of that. We have got very serious, very serious things going on in this world. I want you to take a look at this advertisement. Companies. Now, there are companies everywhere that are doing gene editing based upon the CRISPR-Cas9 system. I'll explain that as we move along. I've got a lot of information to, to get through. May not get through it all today, so we'll probably spill this over into Thursday. But I want you to understand just how significant and how big not only this is now, but how big it's going to be. The ad says when it comes to our DNA, minute changes can make a monumental difference. Now, think DNA and think Bible. As I'm talking about editing DNA, I also want you to consider editing the Bible. Now, I'm going to read this sentence again. When it comes to our DNA, or let's say it this way, when it comes to our Bible, minute changes can make a monumental difference. How true is that statement? If I add the letter A to John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. A minute change makes a monumental difference in not just that one verse, but then that verse skews your understanding of who Jesus is whenever you read about him in the Bible, if you have this idea that Jesus is a lesser God than God Almighty, when you believe that from the change that was made in John chapter 1, verse 1, then you distribute that same idea in every place about Jesus that you read in the Bible. The Bible can call him the everlasting father, but because of John 1, 1 saying the word was a God, you don't believe that he really is the everlasting father. You don't believe that these three are one. You believe that Jesus is a lesser being. And so this statement is true. When it comes to our DNA, minute changes can make a monumental difference, especially when those changes are precisely tailored to help save lives. Our researchers are using gene editing to shield cancer patients, healthy cells from chemotherapy. The result, treatment that's more powerful and effective. Your support makes our work possible. Bold ideas need big support. And there's, it's like it's a check there, and it says pay to the order. Let me see if I can get a, a little red pen going here. Let's see. I want a pen. Yeah. Pay to the order of gene editing to end cancer. That's where the money's going. And again, think Bible. Especially when the, let me read this up here. Especially when those changes are precisely tailored to help save lives. In other words, the, the people now who are editing the new Bibles, they are trying to tell everybody that they're making the Bible better, that they're making it more understandable, or they're saying that we're actually going to be able to save more people by altering and editing these modern translations so that people can understand it better. But is that indeed what they're doing? Are they really trying to make the Bible better? Well, here's my thing. If the Bible's perfect, how can you make it better? That's what I believe. Psalm 139 ties it together for us. Verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Um, think of the womb of a woman being a 
a type or a shadow or a picture of the lower parts of the earth. Where's the beast coming from? He's rising up out of the lower parts of the earth, literally out of the womb of the earth because he's rising up out of the sea and a woman's womb, when it's full of water and it's got a baby in it, that water is salt water. It's an, that baby swimming in an ocean, okay? Literally rising up out of the sea. But anyway, verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So, here it is, David, 3,000 years ago, describing human DNA. This was before um, Watson and Crick. This was before the CRISPR DNA editing system. This was before anybody ever stood, understood anything about how human procreation made a human baby. I mean, they understood the act, but they didn't understand the science of it. However, they did correctly refer to the man's part as being seed because that's exactly what it was. They were calling it that, but they didn't know ex that that was exactly what that was. Seed in the Bible always equals DNA. It always does. Think of uh, Genesis 3.15. Um, there, uh, there shall be enmity between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Literally, thy DNA and her DNA. There's always going to be enmity. There's always going to be a war there. There's always going to be uh, a conflict between the book of Satan and the book of God. And of course, the book of God is the Holy Bible. The, and I'm, uh, I've got this number 66 in my mind because I'm doing the Watchman broadcast. Uh, what did I call it? The, uh, the ultimate King James Code or something like that because I'm dealing with the number 66. But all 66 books, I'll give you this, okay? Let me get let me get kind of full screen here so you can see how my fingers are making these wonderful graphics. Okay. We know that DNA has two strands. One, two. They represent the old New New Testament, right? And they're joined together by the four base pairs, which is a picture of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So in those four base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, in those four base pairs. When your DNA is going to actually write the words of a book, it does so in triplets. It will take out of the four base pairs, out of the four bases, it will pick three of them in a certain order. Let's say that you have adenine, guanine, and guanine. Well, the adenine and the guanine and guanine will make an amino acid, and let's say that's the letter C. And then, right after that, you'll have another triplet. You'll have thymine, thymine, and thymine. So let's say that that triplet makes the letter A. So you have C and you have A. And then you have another triplet. Let's say it's guanine, cytosine, and thymine, GCT. And that triplet will make, let's say, the letter T. So you have the word cat, right? And each letter, each amino acid... Of, of DNA is made by three of the four base pairs in, in any given order, all right? Not, not four, but three of them. Now, here's what's interesting. Mathematically speaking, the total number of combinations that you can have out of using three of the four base pairs in any, let, let's say it could be A-G-T or A-T-T -T or T-T-T -T or C-G-T or whatever. 
the total number of combinations from those three triplets, three out of the four base pairs, making amino acids, the total possible ways you can do that is 64 different ways that you can make, take those four letters, those four base pairs, and take three of them and make different combinations out of them. 64 possibilities. And then on top of that, you have a codon that's called a start codon that signifies that we're fixing to spell out a gene here or a sentence in the book. And at the end, you have a stop codon that signifies, okay, we're done with this sentence. Now we're going to have another start codon to tell you where the next set of genes are. If you add those two together, what do you get? 64 plus 2, what do you get? I'm telling you, God wrote a book. It's called, number one, your Bible. Number two, it's also called deoxyribonucleic acid. In thy book, all my members were written. Here is what is being established in this verse. This is absolutely critical. Your DNA was not written by your father and your mother. Your DNA was written by the owner of the book, and his name is the Lord God Almighty. That's his name. His name is Jesus Christ. Whatever name the Bible gives him, that's his name. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Whatever name the Bible ascribes to him, that's the one who owns the book. He owns the copyright to the book. And that book is a book of life. The, the book that makes me, as a human person, is called DNA. The DNA of our church is, of course, our King James Bible. It is the Bible that makes the creature. And the type of Bible that any church uses will signify who they are, what they believe, and how they do things. If you use a King James Bible, then your church will be a member of the body of people who use a King James Bible. If your church is using, well, we, uh, we in our messages, we like to use the NIV, the message, the New American Standard, today's English version, or sometimes our pastor will rewrite the Greek and Hebrew and come up with his own new translation. What, whatever that church uses, that's what they use. And since there is a significant difference between, let's say, the NIV and the King James... You would never look at those two books and say, well, yeah, they're the same. They're written by the same father. You'd never, mm -hmm. you'd never do that. Not even the United States government recognizes that they're the same because they're not. The United States government gave a copyright to Zonderfin Publishers declaring that the New International Version was significantly different than the King James Version to issue it a copyright and a protection over that book. They're not the same. A church using all of these modern Bible translations is significantly different than a church that uses the King James and only the King James. You see, their rock is not as our rock, our enemies themselves being judges. Even our enemies on this issue say they're not the same Bible. They are significantly different. You follow where I'm going so far? The book makes the creature. And in this case, the book is called a book of life. Now, I want to show you something. Revelation 3, 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. As a born-again Bible-believing Christian, your name is written in God's book. 
And he's only got one of them. It's in his right hand. In his right hand is the word that's forever settled in heaven. And the word that he has in his right hand, I guarantee you, matches the word that you and I, let me read it to you in case you don't believe me. In fact, let me show it. Let me pull up my uh, pure Bible search software here. Let me show you. You know, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That same word is the, is the same word down here on earth as what's in heaven. John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, the book of life and the word of life, are the same thing. And the book of life in heaven matches the word of life that we have down here because John said we've seen it with our eyes and we've handled it with our hands. And when he says that, he's not referring to some mystical spirit thought that you might have had that you described as Jesus. He's actually referring to a book that you can see with your eyes and hold in your hands. It's the word of life. And Jesus told us that if, if we overcame, we'll be clothed in white raiment, and we know what that is. Revelation 19, that those white raiments are the righteousness of the saints, granted to us to be worn by Jesus Christ. And he will not blot out our name out of the book of life. Now watch this. Who doesn't get written in the book of life? Or who gets blotted out of the book of life? Revelation twenty two eighteen. 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. This book. It, in thy book all my members were written. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. So think about it. They're saying that they're using CRISPR editing to add things to human DNA so it can cure our diseases. What man doesn't know, and he doesn't know it because he won't read the Bible and he won't believe the Bible, what man doesn't know is that by adding to the human genome, they're actually adding plagues and diseases that are written in this book. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of what? The book of life. The book of life is DNA. And DNA is the book of life. And those were written by God. And God said, if you use CRISPR editing and you take anything out of the human genome, God will take away his part out of the book of life. Your name is no longer in God's record of DNA, the word of life. By taking something out, You've eliminated your own name from the very book that God intended to give you life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So the two rules, don't add anything like, you know, Book of Mormon, um, the great controversy by Ellen White, don't add that. Don't add, uh, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, the books of the Apocrypha, don't add that. Don't add what the Pope says. Pope says there's no hell. People, Lost people just simply dissolve and they become nothing. That's, that's adding to, number one, it's taking from the book by saying that the Bible's lying about hell and then adding your own version, which says you're, if you're lost, you just dissolve into nothing. So don't worry about anything. That's adding to and taking away from. And God said, when you do that, 
I take you out of the book of life. Instead of leaving you in the book of life, I'm going to take you out of it. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottom of the split and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not yet is. He's opposites here. We won't talk about that today. But you understand now the importance of DNA editing and how it relates to Bible prophecy, how it relates to uh, decisions that you're going to make Let's say, uh, let's say 20 years from now. We'll give it 20 years, right? Could it be 10? Yeah, it could be. Could it be as little as five years? And when I say decisions, choices that you are going to make where they're going to offer to cure your disease, they're going to offer to you, you found out you got cancer. Hey, it just so happens the FDA approved the CRISPR editing system for your particular type of cancer. If you let us do this procedure, it won't take but an hour, we'll do this procedure on you and you will not, instead of you having six months to live, we're going to give you another 50 years. How's that? Decisions like that. Or, i tell you what's hard. Because I've had, to, I've had to deal with this. I've had to go through this. The decision to allow your infant child, the decision to allow your infant child or grandchild to allow them to die rather than having their genes altered. You don't have to tell me how hard that is. I already know how hard that is. The comfort that I had in counseling my own daughter and her husband to go ahead, make the decision to allow her to die The counsel that I gave them from the word of God was, we'll see her again. It's an absolute promise from the Bible. We're going to see her. She's going to be better than she ever was. And it's okay. It's going to hurt. But it's the best thing. I've already been through that. And I can tell you how hard that is. But I'm staunch, people, that if they wanted to change a child of mine or a grandchild of mine or a great-grandchild of mine, if they wanted to alter their DNA so they could live, absolutely not. You're giving her life on this earth, but you're removing life in eternity from her. And I won't stand for that. That decision... That decision is coming. Five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if it takes that long, it takes that long. But I'm telling you, that decision is coming. So get ready for it. This is what is being talked about now. Now that we can edit DNA and do it very quickly, do it easily, do it cheaply. I'm going to show you a website here in a little bit They're selling kits that you can buy for cheap where you can practice changing some organism's DNA. Not making this up. This article, Godlike Homo Deus. You know what that means? The God Man. Let Let me cue some music on that. Come on, you ponder that that word for a minute. 
We already have the God-man and the man, Jesus Christ. The Word, which was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. We already have the perfect God-man. Homo Deus is the new species that's going to replace human. No longer human is where we're headed. The article says evolution is a slow affair taking some 5 million years. That, that, mm. yeah, I don't believe that stuff. To turn a chimpanzee-like creature into us. But what happens when we push down the accelerator and take command of our bodies and brains instead of leaving it to nature? What happens when biotechnology and artificial intelligence merge, allowing us to redesign our species to meet our whims and desires? Historian Yuval Noah Harari explores these questions in his runaway bestseller, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, a kind of sequel to his 2014 book, Sapiens. The title of his new book suggests a startling stage in our evolution. Homo sapiens, which means wise man, far from being the pinnacle of creation, is a temporary creature, one soon to be replaced by Homo Deus, God-man. Cue the music It is very likely within a century or two, Homo sapiens, as we know it for thousands of years, will disappear, Harari told an audience at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs recently. Not because, like in some Hollywood science fiction movie, the robots will come and kill us, but rather because we will use technology to upgrade ourselves, or at least some of us, into something different, something which is far more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals, which... N never those those weren't humans don't believe that harari makes no pretense of being able to peer into the future but advances but the advances humans have made suggest where we may be heading breakthroughs in biotechnology including gene editing methods like crispr hint at the power we'll soon have to change our genes our bodies and perhaps our brains at the same time advances in artificial intelligence including machine learning may soon let us build brain-computer interfaces that will blur the line between man and machine. He said in the next century or two, I say it's going to happen a lot quicker than that. This article, and what I did was I went back through all my Evernotes. And I just started pulling notes about CRISPR DNA editing. By the way, let me, let me just take a minute and explain what CRISPR is. They've tried several different methods of altering human DNA. And the first thing they found out was is that we really stink at editing DNA because it costs millions and millions of dollars. And for every one time we get it right, there's like a hundred times we get it wrong. So we're not good at it. So somebody started thinking about there's this virus, little bacteria. You know what a bacteria is? In the Bible, it's a creeping thing. I just I've I thought of that before the show and haven't had a chance to study it out yet. But a bacteria, you know, bacteria is this one-celled organism and has these little legs all around its body, and how does it move about? It creeps around. It's a creeping thing. You can't see it with the eye. You have to look at a microscope, but that's what it is. And this particular bacteria has the ability to scan foreign DNA. They found out that this particular bacteria had DNA in, in its genome that the scientists said it didn't make sense because the DNA that was in this particular bacteria didn't, didn't have anything to do with this particular bacteria, but it looked exactly like the DNA found in viruses that kill this bacteria. And they got to thinking, wait a minute. 
This bacteria has a record built into its DNA of its enemies. Now, think Bible. Where is it that you and I learn about who our enemies are? They're ri- God tells us how to identify our enemies in our Bible. He said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the general, and there's four, by the way. Think base pairs. Think gospel. Right? And so, if you want to get more specific, you keep reading this Bible, you'll know exactly who your enemies are. Some of them look like lust of the eyes. Some of them look like lust of the flesh. Some of them are like pride of life. But the more you read this Bible, the more it becomes clear to you who's on your side and who isn't on your side. And you're able to recognize them. And then you're able to say, that's not going to be part of my life ever again. Right? 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 Here's this bacteria that has a record of all of its viral enemies. And if this bacteria happens upon a a strand of DNA, it reads it and it checks against its own database to see if it's something that could potentially harm it. And if it finds out that this little piece of DNA is actually its enemy, you know what it does? It, It scans that virus DNA and finds a certain place And it takes this little enzyme and it cuts a piece of that DNA and it reads it until it gets to the end of where it needs to be and it cuts it so that it basically just takes out the part of the virus that could actually kill that bacteria. It cuts it out, gets rid of it. And so the scientists started thinking, wait a minute. I wonder if we could program this bacteria with some new and different DNA records and get this bacteria to scan any kind of DNA at all and find a particular section of DNA, cut it out, either discard it, and, and attach the two ends together or replace it with something else that we want to put in its place. And they found out that it could do it. And they found, they found out it could do it nearly 100% of the time. And they also found out that it didn't cost very much either. It was like the easiest thing. Let the, let the creeping thing do it. It does it better than we do. So now, now, we, now we live, listen to people, we live in the days of revolution. We live in the days of revolution. You and I were chosen by God to live in this time where we are going to see the mark of the beast. We're, we're going to see it. I, I believe with all my heart that the mark of the beast is is DNA based. We're not just talking about a a radio frequency microchip with a little antenna going beep, 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 beep. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something far more permanent. Because now that now that we can successfully edit the DNA of a living being. And we can add it, we can cut out and add literally whatever we want. That we can also not, not just change one cell, but there's a process called gene drive where once it changes one cell in the body, it immediately begins implementation of a program 
to make that exact same change in every cell of your body. Every one of them. So that by the time CRISPR and Cas9 run its course in your body, you are no longer the son of whatever parents brought you into this life. You're no longer that person. You are no longer human. It's over with. You are no longer the creation of God. You are a temple that was manufactured by the hands of man, not built by God. That has spooky, to say the least, spooky implications. Humans will be genetically modified for the first time in Europe as scientists get the go-ahead to use DNA splicing therapy to treat a blood disorder. This is from April 15th, 2018. What day is today? 17th. That was two days ago. In Europe now, humans genetically modified for the first time. We are living in the days of revolution, people. This is just the beginning of human modification. It's going to start out treating people with a blood disorder. Oh, that's so great. Now they're not going to have a blood disorder anymore. Humans will be genetically modified for the first time in Europe after regulators have given the go-ahead to trial DNA splicing therapy. Woolly mammoth on the verge of resurrection, scientists say. The woolly mammoth vanished from Earth 4,000 years ago. But You know, that's roughly the time right after the flood. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever thought about that? But now scientists say they're on the brink of resurrecting the ancient beast. Did you see what that said? Resurrecting the ancient beast in a revised form through an ambitious feat of genetic engineering. The scientists... Uh, leading the de-extinction effort said that the Harvard team is just two years away from creating a hybrid embryo in which mammoth traits would be programmed into an Asian elephant. We're Our aim is to Bruce, produce a hybrid elephant mammoth embryo, said Professor George Church. Actually, it would be more like an elephant with a number of mammoth traits. We're not there yet, but it can happen in a couple of years. The creature, sometimes referred as a mammophant, would be partly elephant, but with features such as small ears, subcutaneous fat, long shaggy hair, and cold adapted blood. The mammoth genes for these traits are spliced into the elephant DNA using the powerful gene editing tool CRISPR. Think about it. We have a beast in the Bible who is dead, and yet he's going to be alive. He's both dead and alive. He's extinct and now de-extinct. At the same time, listen, people, we are learning how to bring things that were dead back to life. Are you getting this? That is a power that before now belonged to God. Jesus had the power to say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Four days he had been dead. How long has the woolly mammoth been gone? 4,000 years. Do you know how long a day with the Lord is? 1,000 years. Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Look at what he did. Look at what he did. He weakened the nations. The word nation in your Bible, you write this down, you do a study of it. The word nation is always a word that denotes a race. All right? A race of people. The um, 
if I were to say the the Kenyans, there's different tribes in Kenya, Luo and some of these others. Samburu is their own tribe. Turkana is their own tribe. So if I were to say the nation of Turkana, I am referring to a genetic group of people known as the Turkana, and they're all related by an ancestor, and they all contain that ancestor's DNA. So when the Bible says he weakened the nations, that term literally is applied to DNA, seed, ethnicity, their race. And Lucifer is the one responsible for weakening them. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Meaning, I'm going to rule over all the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's Mount Zion which is in the sides of the north, the Bible says, or the north side is what that literally means. And the north side is where God, if you read Ezekiel 1, God is coming down from the north side, the north. He's descending from the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then he says his seven words, I will be like the most high. The most high has the ability to create life from something that's dead. Lucifer, we're now giving Lucifer this power through genetic manipulation, taking the DNA of something that has been dead for 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, or 4,000 years. I know that you were told that dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, but that wasn't according to the Bible. According to the Bible, they've only been dead about 5,000 years. And I can't remember where it was or what it was, but archaeologists have discovered Dinosaur, soft tissue, soft tissue, instead of it being in a rock, they've actually discovered the soft tissue. I can't remember what species it was. The possibility exists now that DNA could be extracted from that soft tissue and we could resurrect a species. We, this, this is the day of Jurassic Park. My friends, my brothers, we are on we are now at the beginning of the revolution, not just a revolution, the revolution. Everything is going to change. Everything is. In Genesis 6, <clears throat> the reason why, let me pull that up. The reason why God was angry at the world in Genesis 6 and said he was going to flood the world? The Bible says all flesh had corrupted its way. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination, imagination <coughs> excuse me, of his thoughts, of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and fowls of the air. Four, for it repenteth me that I have made man, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. There was a revolution back in the days of Noah. Everything had gotten corrupt. And we are now living at, we, we're seeing the very beginning 
of a revolu of the revolution to end all revolutions taking place. You and I were chosen by God to live at this time. Think about the possibility of how God is going to use you in these days. I promise you, unless, of course, you're listening to me and you're lost and you're never going to be saved and you're just appointed to this destruction, but I promise you that if you do nothing but stand and say, you're not doing that to me, that, my friends, is the greatest thing that could ever be done. You see, we're not going to, um, what's the guy's name, Infowars. We're not going to follow these people thinking that we're going to take back America and change the whole world and make everything right for God. This is already beginning. The days that are, have been predicted and prophesied in the scriptures, those days are taking place right now. Because man is now altering his own destiny, his own DNA. He figured out the way to rewrite God's book. And just bringing, think, of, think about all the people that are dead that could now be brought back to life again. Both good and bad. I mean, what, what do you think if North Korea ended up with Adolf Hitler's DNA somehow? Let's bring him back to life. Or some evil person from history. We could resurrect him, bring him back to life again. We can bring back Elvis if we want. Unless you're one of those who thinks he's not really dead. These articles, humans will genetically, humans will be genetically modified for the first time in Europe after regulators have given the go-ahead for, to trial DNA splicing therapy. Um... Scientists at the biotech company CRISPR hope that they can alter the body's code to stop the genetic mutation and restore healthy levels of hemoglobin. The disease is the first to be treated using this method in Europe, and experts have said the trials hold promise. Similar trials have taken place in China. However, they do not have the same restrictive regulations as Europe or the U.S., Professor Ruben Lovell Badge, group leader at London's Francis Crick Institute, Francis Crick helped discover DNA told the Sunday Telegraph, we will look back and think that this is the real beginning of gene therapy. And what he means by gene therapy is, we're just going to rewrite it. This type of therapy has been used for the past 30 years as doctors dispense the missing DNA from damaged cells to increase their effectiveness. But the work taking place at CRISPR may be a, long, may be a more long-term solution, which is also proven to be cheaper. The therapy uses the bacteria's natural defense mechanism, which is carrying the strands of deadly viruses so that they can recognize. Anyway, it, gets, it goes on to explaining how CRISPR works. Um, let's see here. The scientists plan to remove the gene which represses the growth of the protein and will allow the patient's bone marrow to again produce high levels of hemoglobin. Darren Griffith, professor of genetics at the University of Kent, told the Sunday Telegraph, quote, Everything I have seen suggests it's very safe and effective. I think the trial results will be positive. Of course he's going to say that. He's got his life, his reputation, and whoever's a part of this stands to make millions and millions of dollars doing this. This is going to be one of the most lucrative, and already is, the most lucrative medical thing in history. Billions are going to be made from this. Hmm. 
There's a movie coming out called Rampage. Guess what it's about? Animals that have their DNA altered. This article, CRISPR from Rampage, is real, and its effects could be even more terrifying than in the movie. Though based on an 80s arcade game, the new action movie Rampage features some high-tech science that's anything but retro. A title card at the start announces that powerful gene editing tool CRISPR was banned by the U.S. government in 2016. Uh, and the opening scene immediately shows why. Orbiting in space away from the pesky rules, some evil company called Energine, their research lab has succeeded all too well at their experiment. It's now running amok and destroying the station. Samples of the new drug fall back to the earth. Think about it. Think about it, people. Think. i got to see this movie. Samples of the new drug fall back to earth. Da, da, da. So, watch this now. DNA that's up in the heavens falls to the earth. Think about it. Because the DNA that's going to quote-unquote immortalize man is going to fall down from the heavens. I'll show you that in the Bible. The scientific breakthrough is indeed very real and is at the cutting edge of research. But don't worry, monsters aren't coming. Um, this CRISPR, short for clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, CRISPR proper is a stretch of DNA sequences used by bacteria as part of their defense mechanism. It's the basis for the technology officially known as CRISPR, Cas9, and uh, that allows the changing of resequencing of DNA with a precision previously unheard of. Science Magazine hailed it as, quote, their breakthrough of the year 2015. In Rampage, Naomi Harris plays Dr. Kate Caldwell, a scientist, a scientist who worked for Energine trying to find a cure for cancer. The company turned her research into a super weapon, utilizing snippets of DNA from various creatures not to help re heal humans or improve their abilities, but to build the ultimate super creature. Now, now uh, th this is all science fiction, right? Who's to say that it's not already science fact? Who's... Who is it out there that could honestly say, well, we don't think CRISPR is being used in a bad diabolical way anywhere on the earth by anyone? Can you say that? Can you know it beyond any doubt? I mean, people, listen to me. We started the revolution. Revolutions don't just stop. Because people say, you know what, this could potentially bring harm, so we're not going to do this. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Despite Rampage's claims, CRISPR hasn't been banned by the U.S. government. In fact, in 2015, U.S. company Ova Science announced that they would continue ongoing research to apply CRISPR to specifically human embryos, human babies being used as guinea pigs, lab rats, human babies. You see, I went to the people, the people in science whose conscience is so seared with a hot iron that they can play and literally, quote unquote, monkey around, no pun intended, with the embryo of a human being and think nothing of it? Since their conscience is already seared with a hot iron, they never think in terms of, is this right or is this wrong what I'm doing? Most scientists don't think that way. Science, they have these panels that, that they call ethics panels. And they make everybody feel good that, hey, there's an oversight panel that's watching what we're doing. And they're an ethics committee and they're going to approve or disapprove. They're all still scientists. And the bottom line is scientists have a curiosity that is just out of this world. Scientists are the people who grew up reading science fiction. 
And they imagined from a very early age. I mean, I wanted these. I used to read. I used to love science fiction. I don't have to read science fiction anymore. I read my Bible. That's science fact. And I see what's going on in this world. You can't make this stuff up. The scientists are the ones who grew up. They spent their life learning everything they can because they never ask, should we do this? They just ask, how can we do this? How can we do this? Uh, let's see here. There are plenty of ethical concerns surrounding DNA altering, and a number of articles have voiced concern about creating superhumans or, quote, However, the potential benefits of CRISPR research, including engineering foods that would support the world's increasing population using less energy and resources, would make a total ban as bad as complete deregulation. In other words, nobody is really interested in stopping CRISPR gene editing from happening. No one's interested in that. It's like giving children five or six different cans of Play-Doh. They're all different colors. And saying to those children, show me what you can make with this. And they're going to come up with all kinds of things. The first thing, of course, is snakes because they're the easiest ones, right? Okay, Snakes are easy. But whatever children can do with Play-Doh, they're going to do. And nothing's going to stop them. And whatever science, whatever they dream up in their mind, I wonder if we can do this. I wonder if we can mix alligator. I wonder if we can give a rabbit the mouth of an alligator. Can they do that? Yeah. Give them, give them a year or two. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Now, why would a rabbit need an alligator's mouth? I don't know. But once you've made it, you sit back and find out what a rabbit would do with an alligator's mouth. People... We're not going to go backwards. We're, we're not going back to Mayberry. We're not going back to the 40s. We're not going to go back to a time of innocence. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. And these things have already been set in motion, and they are going forward. Genetically engineered super horses to be born in 2019 and could soon compete in Olympics. The animals would be stronger, faster, and able to jump higher, scientists hope. Genetically engineered horses designed to be faster, stronger, and better jumpers will be born in 2019 after a breakthrough by the same laboratory which clones polo ponies. Scientists in Argentina successfully used a powerful DNA editing technique called CRISPR to rewrite the genomes of cloned horses. Healthy embryos were produced following the procedure, which the researchers plan to implant into a surrogate mother within two years. The team focused on boosting the myostatin gene sequence, which is crucial to muscle development, endurance, and speed. Theoretically, animals designed in such a way should be able to run faster for longer and jump higher more easily. Traditionally, the same traits would be achieved by breeding animals, which already exhibited desirable features, but it can take many generations to develop a beneficial trait. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something from your Bible. Um, take your Bible, take, your, take the, the word of life that you handle in your hand. And I want you to look at um, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. No. Ezekiel 38. Do we believe the Bible? Yes. Do we believe its literalness? That's the question. 
Because while uh, we would like to say, oh, yeah, I believe the Bible literally in every everything that it says. I don't know if you've ever considered Ezekiel 38, which is the prophecy concerning Gog and Magog. Some say that's Russia and Germany. And you know what? Could be. But I, let's read this for a minute and let's ask ourselves the question, is it literally going to happen this way? Um, verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I tend to think that Gog and Magog, where it says chief prince, remember what we wrestle against, principalities. This is a chief prince, meaning a spirit. All right. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And I want you to look at verse 4. All thine army, horses, and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Persia and Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma, the north quarters, and all of his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited, and in the latter years thou shalt come uh, into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Um, let's see here. Anyway, I want you to look back at verse 4. Let's say that that this event, let's say that it was going to happen. Let's just, let's make, let's say it's going to happen five years from now. Okay. Five years. All right. Just, I'm making this up. I'm not setting a date. And I want you to ask the question currently, how does, let's say that uh, Gog and Magog is Russia and Germany together. All right. Let's just play advocate here. Currently, how does Russia prepare and participate in modern warfare? We know that they have um, jets, MiG fighters. We know that uh, Russia has uh, very powerful rifles. We know that Russia has a lot of tanks. We know that they have a lot of, uh, you know, service vehicles that carry troops, troop carriers, and so on. Here's my question. How many horses does Russia use in a battle? How many actual swords do Russian soldiers carry with them? They don't, do they? They, We don't even put bayonets on the end of guns anymore that I'm aware of. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's been a long time since I've seen even American soldiers on patrol with swords in their hands or bayonets on their rifles. You, just, you don't see that. If your rifle runs out, you drop the clip, put another clip in there, but you just don't go running after them once you run out of bullets with your bayonet. How many swords does the Russian army carry and how many horses do they use? Because this verse, I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields and all of them handling swords. Now, I don't know if it has anything to do with CRISPR editing or not. But we are looking at the real possibility 
of Russia, North Korea, China, and the United States creating an army of super soldiers, right? Super soldiers, soldiers that get shot and it doesn't even phase them. Soldiers that their DNA has been edited in such a way as bullets don't penetrate their skin. Soldiers manipulated genetically in such a way as they never stop fighting or let's say they don't give up fighting and they always obey orders. Horses. Horses that can do things that not even tanks can do. Because we're already taught. Let me look at the article. We're already talking about modifying horses. And what? Having them compete in the Olympics? Really? Is that the, is that the best we can do? What I'm saying is, I believe my Bible, and I believe in its literal interpretation, and I don't look at my Bible in Ezekiel 38 and say, well, swords could mean like guns, or horses could mean tanks. I don't look at my Bible and think that way. I look at my Bible and I say, there is an army coming where they are all going to be holding swords and they are all going to be riding on horses. That's what I believe. And I would suggest that you believe that way too because I know for a fact that when God does what he's going to do in this world, it will be done exactly according to the book not what men made of the book or not how men interpreted the book. It will be done according to the word of God. And if God meant rifles and machine guns, and what he would have found a way to say it 3,000 years ago. But he said horses and he said swords. Is this just something for you to think about. I mean, there's, there's a lot in that Bible that we miss, okay? So, think Bible. China, unhampered by rules, races ahead in gene editing trials. In a hospital of West Shanghai, Wu Shizhu, since March, has been trying to treat cancer patients using a promising new gene editing tool. The U.S. has morals, right? And we say, well, we're, we're, we're not going to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to let China figure out how to do it and let them make all the mistakes because you can't sue somebody in China like you can in America. So the U.S. is smart. The U.S. is watching China start the trial runs, get it perfected, and then the U.S. will jump in and say, you know, we're going to start doing gene editing on humans too. Why? Because China's already made all the mistakes and they've got all the genetic freaks out there. And so... We're going to let them do it, and then we're going to step in and say, yeah, that, we, that we're going to go ahead and start doing this now. U.S. scientists helped devise a tool known as CRISPR-Cas9, which has captured global attention since a 2012 report said it can be used to edit DNA. Doctors haven't been allowed to use it in the human trials in America. That isn't the case for Dr. Wu and others in China. So Amer I, if, if you had, America's playing it smart here. Because if America started with the genetic trials, the first few cases go wrong. I mean, you got lawsuits because that's what we do in America. We sue. You don't have that right in China. You can't sue your employer. You can't sue your doctor. I mean, who? you can't do that in China. So America's playing it like we're going to let China figure out how to do this. And when China makes all the significant breakthroughs, then we're going to steal their technology, and then, then we're going to do it because they've already run through all the mistakes. 
I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. Gene editing can end disease and fight global famine. We're looking at the single greatest advancement in genetics since Mendeleev uh, started growing peas. I think it's talking about Gregor Mendel. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene modification technology is powerful enough to cure humanity's worst diseases, yet simple enough to be used by amateur biologists. Doesn't that scare you? You thought 3D printers and the maker uh, movement were going to change the world? Get ready for a new kind of tinkerer, one of the world's gene snipping, one that wields gene snipping scissors. CRISPR is a potent genetic editing tool. It's called that because each CRISPR unit is made of repeated DNA base pair sequences that can be read the same way forward or in reverse and are separated by space or pairs. Think of it like an organic Morse code palindrome. With CRISPR, we can now edit any genetic code. Read it. We can, we can now edit any genetic code. Who can do it? Who can do this? Amateur biologists. Now, again, America sets rules and says there are just certain things with this that's going to be unethical to do, so we're not going to do it. China's going to do it. North Korea's going to do it. Iran is going to do it. Syria's going to do it. Russia's going to do it. Any rogue nation, any rogue nation is going to figure out some way of doing, I've mentioned this a while back, and this, this stuff, it is so scary what people can do now. We literally... If you ever believed there was a Pandora's box, we just opened it. Because there's no way now that we're going to get all of this back in the box and back under control. I mean, think about it. Muslims. Well, they hate the Jews, don't they? And they don't just hate people whose name happens to be Weinstein. They actually hate a genetically recognizable race of people, don't they? How hard would it be to take a, a simple biological disease, you know, like anthrax or Ebola, how hard would it be now to figure out a way to release a strain of Ebola all over the world? People not even knowing that it happened. A strain of Ebola that only targeted genetically recognizable Jews. How hard would it be? How hard would it be for any rogue nation or any well-backed group whatsoever to develop a, a virus of some kind that could kill literally everybody in the world that had a certain genetic trait, such as being a Jew? Because being a Jew, I mean, that's not hard to figure out, right? You got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have the 12 tribes, and there's enough people around the world, I'm pretty sure, that they've mapped out what it is that makes a Jew and what it is that makes someone not a Jew. And it would just be that simple to release something in the air that if you had no Jewish genetics in you whatsoever, you would be going... I feel fine. And yet, if you were a Jew, you could eliminate every single one of them. Obviously, God's not going to let that happen. But you get this, don't you? One nation at war with another nation. 
I mean, think about th- let, let's think about the United States and North Korea, right? I mean, how hard is it to spot an American in North Korea? Okay, I mean, hey, look, there's an American three miles over there. You see him? Because in North Korea, they all look alike and they have all the same genetics. And if we wanted to, America could eliminate everybody in North Korea using gene editing CRISPR-Cas9 system. Revolution. We're in the days of revolution. Now, there is always a spiritual aspect to this always and of course i'm running out of time but i'm just going to set you up for thursday's pmo the spiritual aspect to what crispr cas9 represents take a look at this article this is josiah zayner a biohacker with a company called Theoden. Dun, dun, dun. Where did he get that name from? Do you know who Odin is? I mean, other than the Marvel Comics version of Odin. Do you know who he is? Not all of the emerging uses for CRISPR technology are quite as severe as the diseases Pearlstein Lab is combating. Jo- Josiah Zayner, founder and biohacker of the Odin, it's a real company, wants to turn every man into a citizen scientist, specifically an amateur synthetic biologist. He said, I worked for Motorola in the early 2000s before the dot-com bubble burst. He said, I controlled the systems that allowed these old walkie-talkie cell phones to work. Zayner told me during a recent interview at his home headquarters in Castro Valley, California. After going back to school to earn his Ph.D. at the University of Chicago, Zayner worked at NASA's Synthetic Biology Lab at Ames Research Center. He said, one scientist can only accomplish so much, Zayner reasoned. So he asked himself, how can I get more people involved? What happens if I go out and get five people, train them, pay them a decent wage, and have them help me with these science projects? This was the impetus for the Odin's DIY CRISPR kits. Do you know what DIY stands for? In this case, I'm going to say destroy it yourself. Okay? Destroy it yourself. Because that's, that's where we're going. Man is setting up his own destruction. He's digging his own pit. He's going to fall into it. He's making his own chains. He's going to lock himself up with it. He's fanning the flames of his own hell. And he's going to burn in it. He said, I thought something like the CRISPR kits is something the public would grasp could grasp and be able to use, Zayner said. It would provide people who have no previous experience with not only a new and unique experience, but also stimulate their curiosity in biology and science in general. He said, I'm showing them how cool science can be, and in the process, they're learning to do science, which I think strengthens the world. Zayner wants to use harmless, as in like non virulent E. coli, and yeast cultures to help teach the basics of genetic engineering. The kits are designed to act as introductions to the technology, providing simplified sample experiments for people to follow. You get to change the genome of an organism. That's what he said. I want you to think about this. High school students in their bedroom next to their Spider-Man poster, and Avengers posters, right? High school students learning. I mean, I made a science kit for a science fair when I was in school. Yes, I made the baking soda volcano, okay? The baking soda volcano. <laughs> and, it, and it worked. 
<laughs> but everybody else makes a baking soda volcano. Big deal. This is the 21st century. We just started a revolution. You're going to have children. You're going to have children altering DNA of anything it wants. The, if you go to their website for $20 you can buy human myostatin knockout targeting CRISPR Cas9 plasmid for $20 you can buy a kit called Odin. I'm not making this up. You can buy a kit called Odin and learn how to edit human myostatin, whatever that is. 20 bucks. You can buy a kit called the Odin and learn how to change DNA. You can, I want you to get this now. For $20, you can violate the last two commandments that God gave us in the Bible. Don't add to, don't take away from. 20 bucks, that's all it takes. Um, of course, you know me, I'm looking at symbols, right? Okay? I mean, you see all this right here? See all this going on here? Okay. Do you see this? Do you know what that is? Here's Odin. I'll show you in a minute. Here's Odin. Odin has his eye put out. He is a god. Often he he's the he's like the um, inspiration for Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Odin carries his staff. He's got his eye put out. He's like robed and hooded. He's covered with a mantle. Do you remember the familiar spirit that Saul thought was Samuel but wasn't? He looked like Odin. He was, he was wearing a robe. He was covered with a mantle so he couldn't see his face. Zechariah eleven seventeen. 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. This is the opposite of Jesus, the good shepherd. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Odin is the idle shepherd, the opposite, the antichrist that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. The one-eyed God is who Odin is. Woden's day, somebody pointed this out to me. I thought, man, this is brilliant. Woden's day is the, do you remember Odin's sacrifice? It was on Odin's day that the guy went in and killed all those kids in that elementary school. Odin's day is the middle day. You have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And Odin's day is in the middle. Odin's day is what joins the past with the future. That's why, o that's why Woden's day is in the middle of the week. It's the middle day. And it, Odin is like this, is like Janus, the two-faced God. He's looking in the past and he's looking to the future. He is Revelation 17, the beast that is not, yet is. Or the species that is extinct, yet is alive because of genetic alteration. And this guy called his company the Odin. 
named his na- listen to get he named his genetic alteration company after the antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition the idle shepherd who had his eye put out the bible says specifically his right eye this is why on the back of the $1 bill you have the all-seeing eye of god but it's only one eye and if you look closely it's the left eye the right eye is gone what does that mean think think of um think bible here you have two parts of your you have two eyes you have two parts of your bible you have the old testament which is all israel sees israel is blinded in part it's like they've got one eye that doesn't work the left eye sees the old testament the right eye sees the New Testament. When you use both Old and New Testament, you get the full and complete depth of everything that God is. You get, you understand all of his doctrine. You understand the, the New Testament doctrine based upon the Old Testament types and shadows. I mean, you, you do literally see the depth using your two eyes. But Odin... The idle shepherd, he's missing his right eye. You know what he can't see? He can't see the same thing Israel can't see. can't see the New Testament. So he's blinded in part. He's not completely blind, but all he sees is the law. All he sees is do this or I'll kill you. Follow my commandments or the penalty for not following the commandments is death. And that's who the Antichrist, that's why he has ten kings. Ten toes, ten horns, ten commandments. There is no mercy, there is no grace, there is no forgiveness when all you know is the law. So the right eye being put out same same thing with Israel. They can't see grace. They can't see forgiveness. They can't see Christ being our justification and our righteousness, even though we're sinners. They, Israel can't see that. The Antichrist is no mercy. That's what he represents. No mercy, no forgiveness. The Antichrist is the fulfillment of what happens when you break the Ten Commandments. Okay? Now, there's a lot more on this. Okay? And I'm not anywhere near done. Okay? But I'm going to try to finish it Thursday. Thursday. Study Odin. Study Yggdrasil. Y-G-G-D-R-A-S-I-L. Because that plays into the, the same company that sells the oat. They sell a tree. The Yggdrasil. If you've watched the Marvel superhero movies, you know a little bit about it. It's called the World Tree. What does it represent? All right? It's, I'll give you this. It's the opposite of the cross. Anyway, more to come. We'll be uh, with you again on Thursday. Pastor Mike Online live broadcast. Uh, Going to try to get another Watchman broadcast out by the end of this week. Finishing up that series on the numbers. I haven't showed you the cool stuff yet on the number 66. It'll, it'll blow you away. This Bible's right in everything that it says. And we are living in days of revolution. Okay? Always think Bible.